Hey everybody, uh, this is a really sped up video this time, but it has to be because of the size. I am doing a, a commission for an old friend of mine uh, from the 501st, and I am doing Gambit and Rogue, the 1990s Gambit and Rogue, uh, kind of the original appearance of Gambit when uh, he first appeared on the scene, and Rogue during that time with the bomber jacket and the headband, etc. Uh, we are using for this one uh, ink tents pencils made by the Derwent Company. Uh, big fan of the Derwent ink tents. Uh, another artist friend of mine kind of tuned me into them. I'd never even seen them before, and after looking at one or two of his pieces done in them, I started, you know, just kind of kicking around the idea of what would we like to draw with solid ink, and that's essentially what these are. These are um, think of a watercolor pencil, which some people are already scared by, and it is a just traditional pencil, but instead of being filled with graphite, it's filled with a solidified lead, and uh, it becomes hyper intense when you add water to it. That's why it's called ink tense. So what you may have noticed at the very beginning, um, I like to start off usually with a little bit of a layer of water, just to kind of what we call prime the area. That's a nice artist term for getting the area ready to to work on. Uh, with canvas, usually it's done with like a gesso or something like that, but with paper, uh, especially when you're using anything that's water-based, you just put water down. And when I put the water down first, it allows the ink tense pencils to become super thick and far more uh, dense than they would normally. If I did not put the water down, which you'll see in a couple of, uh, of instances later, it becomes uh, very coarse, like a, uh, like a hard colored pencil as opposed to a soft colored pencil, like Prismacolor. And so like it, it almost looks like a cheap Crayola pencil when you first put it on. And uh, those have their uses, but not when you're trying to get the cleanliness. But when you add that water first, then all of the ink becomes really dense. Uh, the color becomes far more vivid and uh, it just really pops. But what I love about it is while they don't have the number of options, like they don't have 30 or 40 different blues like you might get from a Prismacolor, uh, they do have uh, roughly 10 different blues, maybe 12, and uh, you can go between them and get some just beautiful values because essentially you're using ink. So if you mix properly, then you have the ability to get some crazy things out of it. Uh, I may end up doing a kind of a video cap uh, at some point with just a handful of things I've done with the ink tents prior to starting to shoot videos. So it looks really solid right now. It doesn't look like it, it is uh, uh, the boot that you'd think it should be for Gambit. But when you start to add in the other colors and you start to really use the shadows, uh, like that lighter ridge that I have at the bottom and now getting a, a darker side going on. And then I start to blend with adding a little bit more water over it. That's when it starts to really become more three-dimensional and you start to get a much better pop. If you, you tune into all my videos, you'll you see me, you know, I talk about pop often. Um, not pop in the sense of soda, if you're from up north, not pop in the sense of uh, pop art, although it does essentially mean close to the same thing. What I'm talking about is see the, the color differences and see how the lights and shadows play between solid surfaces and just really giving the illusion of something that is um, three-dimensional or exciting and you, you kind of want to learn more about it on a flat surface. See now instantly between uh, four different blue ink tense pencils and varying how I use my water, sometimes water first, sometimes water second, uh, then all of a sudden I really just explode the color. Again there's that pop which you can see in the neck gurgit that Gambit wears and uh, you can see in the boot. So again, this is a hyper sped up video due to the original size. I mean, it was about four hours of video cut down to about two hours. And then I'm, I'm, as I'm learning more and more about cutting video, I uh, exported the whole video over without sound and uh, in order to save it and then speed it up again. Because I can only speed it up so fast with the original shooting. So even two hours, which was edited and double speed, was just way too much for YouTube. So I needed to do this, uh, this version that's just about an hour. So see what I'm doing is I'm going in now with a white to add some highlight. 
And notice how the middle of the calf and the middle of the boot just became darker, uh, all because I added that white. Did I really make it darker? No, I added no black. I don't like to use the black when I do the ink tents or even when I paint often, I, I just don't like using black, but I love using darker versions. But one of the ways to make uh, a, a blue look darker is to get it as dark as you can without black and then go somewhere else and make it a super light blue so that, that dark blue looks darker. It's a nice little illusion and it just creates depth. In the real world, without heavy shadows, things don't just become black. So blue wouldn't turn black just because it would turn a darker blue. So here I am starting on uh, the next section, doing a little bit of red in the chest. Um, I did wet it first and now I'm going back in and re-wetting it. And look how just after I re-wet that red, how it just explodes, it really over, uh, overly pops. So it was nice to begin with because of me putting the water on the paper first, but it just becomes so much nicer once I hit it with that red uh, again and then hit it with the water again. So again, in this case, it's really not a red, but it looks super red. It's a, uh, again, we're looking at an ink tense pencil. Uh, specifically, it's one called Carmine or Carmine Pink. Really, it's a brilliant color. Lots of fun. Great to play with. And again, notice how when I alter how much water I use, I can get lighter values inside. Uh, and then I can go back into the areas that I want darker and then add more color to darken those up, and eventually I can add white in there to lighten up the areas I do not want dark. So now we've just altered it up. I'm no longer using the carmine, uh, but I'm now using the next uh, color that I want to use, which I jumped from the carmine pink up to the deep rose. I'm pretty sure at some point I get into the fuchsia as well. But right now I'm still playing with the deep rose and then adding water and really allowing it to become more natural. So what I hope you're seeing here and what I really want you all to take away is that sometimes a more natural feel is uh, a great thing in comics. So often we get hung up on those black outlines and I am learning to embrace a more painterly style and just get rid of them. So I, I sometimes do get asked why I would do something that would not have that painter or that uh, black outline and why I'd go for the painterly style. Uh, years ago, I was uh, asked to submit a portfolio to a comic company. And then when I did, they the only comment they had was uh, that I was way too reliant on black outlines. So uh, I, I thought it was kind of a slap that I was asked to submit a portfolio. And then as soon as I did, I was immediately told that I was too traditional uh, in the comic world, um, but that what I what I this, here's the moral of the story. The moral of the story is every time someone gives you a piece of advice, walk away and think about how you can use it. Even if you hate the advice at first, think about as an artist how you can use that advice. And in this case, it took years for me to really consider how to how to use it. Uh, but growth is good, and I started thinking about how I can use that more painterly style. Uh, to get rid of the darker outlines. And sometimes it's also just about finding the right tool to help you. Uh, in this case, it's about finding the, the ink tense pencils or just getting better at painting, getting better with color pencil, getting better at fine illustration. So I started studying the work of other artists that did it. I found uh, artists, some that are long dead and really just dove into their work and started to see how they did things. Um, there's an interesting technique. Watch what I'm doing. I'm taking the colors I want to use, and instead of really laying down a heavy dose of the color directly onto the paper with the pencil, I am wetting the brush and just touching the tip of the pencil in order to get the desired uh, value and, and color in there. And again, I'm lessening that value, so a much lighter value. We would call those tints when we lessen the value. Uh, actually, in this case, it's not really a tint. I'm just de-intensifying it. Tint is when you add white, I'm de-intensifying it with water. But again, it's giving me that more painterly, more natural and uh, traditional fine art style without heavy black outline. Uh, because again, as I was told very politely, but told uh, much to the detriment of my feelings at the moment, um, 
the real world doesn't have black outlines. You know, you look at someone's chin, they don't have a big black outline around it. If they do, it's usually because there's something wrong. So taking advice to heart is a good thing. Now, what I will say is that the Derwent can be difficult at times to play with uh, skin tones. So what I've learned is that you really have to play with not just the skin, but you have to play with what's around it in order to uh, liven up the skin. Otherwise, it ends up getting too yellow or too red. Um, it is possible to blend these by taking a little bit. I've seen, uh, or actually I should say, I've heard of artists taking these and shaving off bits of the tip into a palette and then adding water to it, and then they can blend their ink, and then they just paint it on as if it were painting with ink. So not quite the paint pencil at that point, or the ink pencil, but a, uh, a really cool idea. So notice going back in now, there, I, I, thought I, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm going to go back in with the fuchsia in order to really darken that up. And then, uh, so not only did I go in there with the fuchsia, but I, I think this is actually not even the fuchsia. I'm pretty sure I'm going in with a, a, a deeper red. Uh, probably, if I recall correctly, going in with a, uh, a chili red, which is another one of the Derwent colors. And if it's not a chili red... It's going to be probably a, uh, if, again, the chili red or the Shiraz, because those are two of my favorite reds. But what you also should notice is that I'm trying to hit common color areas. So I hit all the blues and gambit, hitting all the, you know, starting to hit the fuchsias. Um, because it's, it's just easier when you're working with a color to try and hit as many areas as you can within that same color. Although sometimes I do find myself jumping a little bit. As I mentioned in another video, sometimes I get a little ADD and I just want to jump onto something new. All right, so there I am holding up uh, the light brown that I'm going to start working on with the coat. It might have been a little hard to see that light brown. So let's talk about that. I use a series of browns. I'm pretty confident that what I just held up was a mustard. I used a lot of the mustard, but I also used a lot of the saddle brown. It worked out really well to add a leathery effect. And throughout the piece, I'm fairly confident that between the mustard, the saddle brown, I did throw in bits of tan to lighten it up. Uh, looking at that, that is definitely the mustard. And it gave it a nice base, and I used a lot of that. And I'm pretty sure I used some amber as well as some other dark ones as well. But a lot of that mustard. Now, that's a weird color. That by itself does not make for Gambit's coat. And anyone who remembers Gambit's coat back when he wore the brown one before he started wearing the white one that I've seen in the comics more recently. Uh, I'm glad he's back to wearing the brown one. I think he is, at least. Uh, this was just a base coat. And then I can go in with other browns. And this mustard, as bright as that is, will become more of a highlight for me as opposed to the core. All right, so playing with the back end of the coat there and making sure that the color blends well. I'm going to start playing with the sleeve in a second. And what you'll start to notice is uh, it's going to jump a little bit at some point soon. I'm going to be adding a bunch of color really quickly. So an important thing to see here, if you look at the bottom of the coat where it starts to fall behind Gambit, uh, we're still using the mustard. And it looks a lot darker. If you look between that particular value of the mustard and the other versions of the mustard that you see throughout the rest of the coat, it looks greatly different. Why? Because I uh, had a little bit more water and uh, saturated the paper first, and then I really went in with that uh, pencil and got it nice and dark and heavy. And then I can blend away from that. Why do I want that? Because it's where light works. So getting in there with the darker one now.
pretty sure that's the saddle, saddle brown. So again, as I told you, using that mustard as a, a base just for kind of highlighting the areas and then being able to go back in with that uh, saddle, and I'll do the same with other browns, it's a really good thing, and it allows me to just be sure that I'm getting my highlights and my lowlights, which really, this that, that saddle brown ends up becoming uh, pretty confident. It's more of my, my mid-range, even though I do get parts of it to get pretty dark, as you can see there. Kind of funny, had a conversation with uh, one of my, my favorite artists, a guy by the name of Buckshot. Uh, if you're not familiar with his work, uh, you got to look him up, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, Buckshot Art. He's just absolutely phenomenal. One of my best friends and just a phenomenal artist. He and I used to do comics together uh, way back in the day, and we still put out uh, artwork together under uh, kind of a, a studio of ours called The Pencil Pushers. But uh, Buckshot and I talked about color theory one time, and we were just talking about how one of the reasons why animated stuff, good animated stuff, like the Batman animated series, for example, looks so good is because oftentimes they'll stick to three basic colors. A lot of people think cartoons are, are really flat, uh, but the really good ones will, instead of going with one or even two colors, for example, on a skin tone, uh, they will go with four. So they have a, a, the low light, which would be the darkest. You've got maybe one or two mid-tones, and then you go with a highlight. Uh, so using that philosophy, whenever I go for a more realistic or painterly approach, I try to go for usually around four colors within a family, uh, one highlight, two mid-range, and then one low light. Sometimes, depending on the shadows, it might be one highlight, one mid-range, and uh, two different low lights. And then speaking with another artist friend of mine, a guy named Eris, phenomenal artist, uh, just great penciler. Uh, he probably would have been be shocked to know that I'm even bringing this conversation up or that I'm mentioning him on YouTube. Uh, but Eris is just fantastic. And he and I had a conversation about light sources many years ago. Going back 13 years ago, he and I just talked about light sources and how uh, in comics, when it comes to coloring, so many people want to color from one side, like there's only one light source. But the reality is that unless you're sitting in a dark room with one lamp on you, there's usually a secondary light source somewhere. So like right now, uh, you can see from the light that I'm putting on there, the primary light source is at Gambit's back, um, but there's still gonna be some folds of darkness in there because of the way that the light falls on the objects. But once I start to get to uh, rogue a little bit, I think you'll start to see that I've got a secondary light source in there as well. So there's that really dark going in there to give us the low light. But what you also may have noticed is that I used a little bit of the white uh, on the edge, but I went over the white with the brown in order to create, um, instead of blending colors, instead of trying to get a mix of the two, I wanted just a pure tint of that color on the very edge to give me the lightest version of it to signify light. And now I'm going for that really dark inside the kind of the lapel of the coat and getting some in the shoulder. And that's going to make, uh, again, just a really nice, realistic, kind of uh, rough, leathery looking trench coat. Uh, I, I don't believe for a minute that this trench coat was cloth. While, I mean, of course, in comics, they never really say. We know oftentimes the main characters, you know, their, their main outfit is spandex. But what kind, of, what kind of material is the coat? I'm going with leather. I own a couple of, of trench coats, and I just can't imagine Gambit... Uh, jumping around wearing a basic you know tweed trench coat it's probably a fantastically rich and thick jacket which makes it a little heavier but that's okay so for me i'm going with that going for more of that leathery look
Yeah, so adding water and then going with the brown and then adding some white and then watch for now, you know, going back in with a little bit of water to lighten out to the white. Really smooth it out, but that's definitely not going to be done yet. Notice I'm brushing in the direction I want it to go. I'm not brushing in any willy-nilly direction. I always want to brush and keep my strokes going in the direction of which the, the fabric or the cloth would move. Uh, so if it moves at a, uh, let's just say, toward 3 o'clock and then rolls down towards a 4 o'clock, then that's the direction of my brush stroke. Otherwise, I'm going to have conflicting textures and light threads inside my color, which uh, really don't work, at least not for that uh, more representational effect. And again, I am trying to represent something that's real. There you go, really getting some nice strokes in there to go along with the shadow lines, really to get those low lights. And again, you got just a nice highlight, so that coat's starting to look pretty crisp. All right, so, you know, kind of indicating where I'm going to start working here. So remember, she's wearing a coat too, but I'm changing up. I'm using a different brown. I'm using more of a, a reddish brown. Uh, let me verify that color. I'm pretty confident that that uh, reddish brown is the uh, what's called the the baked earth. Pretty confident that I'm using the baked earth, baked earth there. So just getting a slightly different color to her coat, even though it's also a leather jacket. As weird as it is, I kind of rationalize it that her, her coat would feel like it's more of a worn leather. Uh, even though Gambit gets in plenty of his tussles, uh, Rogue is known for her invulnerability, or at least at this point in her career she was. So she would jump right into the fray and take the hits, take the blasts, take the stabs. So her jacket's got to be a little bit more uh, worn, a little bit more run down. And it's going to have, therefore, more of the nice divots and aged effect that leather gets when it's been beaten up a little bit. So you notice how I'm getting a little bit of that light source coming from her back as well. So again, there's a secondary light source, so each one of them gets a little bit of light at their front, but m much more light at their backs. So he's kind of blocking her light, she's blocking his light, and they each have their own source from behind them. And this is again going for that more realistic look we, we call representationalism. It's not the same thing as realism. We'll get into that in another video. That same process uh, using multiple colors to just continually go through and layer out, layer out, layer out. So even though I've shot another video where I really get into the question that somebody asked about backgrounds, I'm looking forward to you all seeing how I laid out the background in this particular piece. Um, simple, very simple. When I planned the piece, I planned for a decent amount of what we call negative space. That would be the space that's not as important to us, the viewer. Uh, and in this case, the, you know, the subject, meaning Gambit and Rogue, what we actually care about takes up a good amount of the paper, roughly 65%, which is a little less than you usually want, but because of the pose they're in, uh, they're going to, you know, his legs are forward, then his coat goes backward, and they have a weird amount of space around their shoulders. Uh, that's not what you normally want, so you got to plan some really cool background that feels like it's not just some thrown in background, and you'll see that soon. But again, really loving the jacket at the moment. Uh, I had forgotten now as I go back and watch as you know, I'm, I'm drawing and painting that. Uh, just loving that color, loving that, that baked earth and adding some of the, uh, I believe it was called chocolate over it. And they're jumping ahead to getting some of those greens in. 
no reason to, to watch all of the process. And you can also see that I've got some of the, uh, the pinks and fuchsia in with the stripes and gambit's pants now. So definitely did some inking with the pencil, then went in with water and brushed it in, tried to get it to be nice and clean, and now I'm going back in and adding more green to it to darken and up those areas, again using those lights. Jumping in with the yellow. So got Rogue's brown belt done, now I'm working on that yellow. I'm actually cleaning up the green first, but just a little bit of cleanup. And uh, now we're jumping in with the yellow, so hitting her gloves, hitting her boots, uh, which were more fun to color than I would have normally thought. So filling out that uh, the yellow parts of her outfit with what is called the cadmium yellow. And for those who play with color often, that's one of the basics. All right, a little brief jump to just some of the highlighting. Going back in, just using that water to really brush out the cadmium. If you'll notice that with the yellow, I did not do the ink first. I did the penciling first. Um, Honestly, not 100% sure why on this one, uh, but what I do know is that by leaving that leg a little bit brighter at the end, it, it gave me the, uh, the forced opportunity to go in and have to, to really brush it clean. I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, just watching it now, it's kind of like, ooh, why would you do that, Sobel? And, uh, you know, thankfully, I have enough confidence in my brush control that comes from experience that I wasn't too overwhelmed or lost by it, but it can be a bit of a pain. Uh, so you just gotta be careful. Right now you can still see a lot of my pencil underneath the yellow. That's the drawback to yellow. Anybody who paints with yellow will tell you that that is a consistent issue and just something you gotta be aware of. All right, so same normal policy. Once I have a base coat and it dries, I go in with uh, getting some darker. You can still see some of that lighter up at the front, uh, which was good for the value. Not Again, not the best way to get to it. I should have cleaned it up a little first before jumping in, but now I'm getting uh, that darker value over the cadmium. And this really gives me the opportunity to get some of those low lights. Uh, for example, getting chest, getting the wrinkles in the boot, getting the underneath by her thigh and buttock. Uh, so everywhere where I've got that yellow that needs to become more folded with the cloth and with the curves of her body, uh, that would be something that I'm getting with the darker. There you go, like that blend. Not done with it yet, but I do like what I got from it there. There you go, love that. See, that's where it really gets gets fun when I put in that third color. Uh, so, so far there's three different colors in there. As I told you, I use three or four usually just to get that realism or representationalism. All right, so jumping over, getting some of that green in Rogue's eyes. Got to be really careful, so switch up the brush to a smaller brush. And then adding some of that white highlight over the skin so that I can start to uh, mute it 
with some other colors shortly which should be starting any second now there we go going back in with some pink and remember if i already have some of that white there then no matter how muted or de-intensified i get that uh, color i'm already having the white there as a base so that will lighten the whole thing up but don't be afraid of going back in and adding more water just to really mute that color or de-intensify it make it less intense if you'd rather say it like that and i'll be honest when i do stuff like this i do prefer close-ups because you can get tons of different colors all within a range if you go super close but when you're doing a full body pose or in this case a two full body pose the distance makes you lose color so you just don't get the uh the depth and the richness with certain colors that you would get if you were up close so trying to get those shadows So look, that's really white with Gambit's face at first because of that white I put in there. But I'm going over some of that pink. And once I start really layering in the color, his face will stop being quite so white and become much more uh, rosy. And we're going to get started on Gambit's hair using some uh, darker browns. That first. There we go. We got all those wisps that are going to kind of go everywhere. So again, I'm going for that 90s Gambit, but definitely not the uh, first appearance of Gambit when he has that almost ridiculous flat top with some spikes up top, but going for the more Joe Madeira 1990s, uh, the hair started falling down a little bit, gravity had taken over, and Gambit's hair no longer stood like a weird crew cut or flat top up high. No more kid and play for Gambit. So again, a nice base coat, and then let's zoom in, and we can start to play with it from there. So the same chocolate that I used to accentuate the darker areas of Rogue's jacket, I'm now using on uh, Gambit's hair. So notice that light source up to the top. And then filling in where I need to fill in because there are some gaps that I knew I just needed to get in there nice and dark. And it looks almost black, but again, it's just that really dark charcoal, or excuse me, a uh, chocolate brown. Don't be afraid of getting in there with individual wisps. But that's the beautiful thing about lots of colors. So if you're playing with lots of colors and you layer, uh, you can just add single lines and that will create that, uh, that hair effect. Now I do like that you can see the trails of my brush strokes with the water there. Because that's a, that's a good thing to be able to see for the sake of understanding the movement And then using some of that brown to just touch upon his cheekbones a little bit and get into the lips very lightly. Also a good idea. So I'm working Rogue's hair here with the, uh, sadly, the light up toward the top. Uh, I'm starting to block some of it. Um, this is something I'm getting used to early on in, in the YouTube process, uh, sh shooting video. 
Uh, not something that I, I had done much prior to now. And while this is the fifth video that I'll be posting on YouTube, it is actually the second video I shot. So there's a lot of stuff that I've learned even in a short period since then that some of you have seen some probably higher video quality from me. Uh, even though uh, you saw them earlier, they actually were filmed later. So filling in that brown here and getting the wisps. Notice I'm using a dry technique, which just like in painting means I'm adding no water to my media, uh, uh, excuse me, medium first. Uh, in this case, medium is the pencil, but then I'm using the water with the brush to go through and get a more clear and more intense line with it. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm dry brushing in the sense, or I'm dry drawing in the sense that I'm drawing with the ink, uh, dry in this case, whereas almost everything else you've seen me do, I wet the paper first and then went in with the ink. Uh, in this case, I am drawing with the ink as a rough solid and then going in and adding my water. And that does, uh, it, it creates some stronger lines right off the bat but it also allows me to lighten up my pencil stroke in certain areas, uh, similar to where I am right now, and I can then use that heavy, that beautiful ink and fill in some of those lighter areas as I want to fill them in. Um, because I left the, the paper clear, uh, it becomes basically a white receptacle that I can gloss over. Whereas if I wet that area, I am more likely as I draw for that ink to just spread just a little bit. Not super likely. Ink tense pencils are good about not doing that, um, but they will a little. And notice that how, how heavy and beautiful that color is. Super rich and intense there, uh, which to me is just like how like why they're, these are called ink tense pencils. Super rich, super intense, and made of ink. It's not meant to be funny. It's just. Uh, one of those things that when I tell people ink tense pencils, like what makes them so intense? No, not intense pencils, ink tense, but they are quite intense. Just look at that color. Look at how it just magnifies and just really, really starts to glow. So I just finished putting, uh, just finished putting those last touches with the darker. Uh, I think I went back to that chocolate again, but it went the, the chocolate inside of the uh, reddish brown. And honestly, I cannot remember which reddish brown I used. But now going back in and just really adding some of those darker uh, tones inside there. Or I should not say tones. Excuse me, darker uh, shades with the uh, brown. So now it's it's just getting more three-dimensional, more realistic. We had to remember that color and values work together to turn the flat into the apparently three-dimensional. It is a nice optical illusion. We should take advantage of it. So that hair is starting to look a lot better now. All right, so we had a little bit of a jump. Uh, finished up the red, uh, just retouched the red in the lips a little bit, did the red and the logo on the jacket. And now I'm starting to use a uh, Payne's Gray in order to do all the glove work and the pant work on Gambit. 
Now, the Ink Tense has numerous grays. Uh, the Pains is a really good one. If we were doing a limited color palette, which I swear at some point I will do a video on exclusively limited color palette, the Pains gray becomes super important because it is a gray, which I can turn into a black with a little bit of um, just heavy handed use of it. But by uh, watering it down just slightly, you realize the Payne's Gray has such a blue uh, build that it can be used with things to act as a blue. So you basically get a blue feel out of it without it being blue, which you can see happening in Gambit's pants now. There's just that, that like hint where it looks like I'm using a dark blue. I'm not. That's actually a gray. Um, and, and a good number of limited color palette options use Payne's Gray as a black and as a blue and because of course it's a very blue thing you can use it to give the sense of anything that involves blue so i could use this with yellows to create something that feels green or use something with uh, red to make it feel purple and it's just if you're if you're only painting or drawing with three or four colors then the paints gray becomes a great option and again at some point i will do a painting using the zorn palette uh, which specifically is just four colors, Payne's Gray being one of them. All right, so I loved putting those highlights in Rogue's hair and using the white to do the highlights all throughout uh, ears and eyes, uh, using some outliner to just lightly go in, give her the eye makeup, uh, or do the, the mascara, and to do her eyebrows, which you're, you're seeing there now. And I was able to get the, uh, the stripes across Gambit's gurgit, or the neck armor. And now I'm going in and getting that X nice and darkened up. I'm pretty sure that when I first do it, it looks really dark, so I had to just lightly smudge it and uh, then go back in and just clean it up a little bit. Again, it's an ink, so as, soon, as long as I attack it early enough, it'll, uh, it'll wipe away. And then just going back over everything with the red just to really, really, really get that red to show. So again, I'm not trying to skip around too much. Using some ink to clean up the eye makeup, give her eye lashes, did the... Uh, the stubble on Gambit and cleaned up his nostril a little bit, but then notice how I'm using that golden brown to really get in for a final uh, three-dimensional effect inside the knee, but I love that white on the outside. So just using the white ink over everything else. Uh, when I first got these, uh, I didn't like the white ink at all because I didn't feel like it was, in, it was intense enough. I thought that out of all the inks in there, the white was the lightest, not just in color, obviously, but the lightest in intensity. It just felt like it took forever to get anything out of it. And the more and more I used it, the more I fell in love with the white uh, because I was finding myself using it, putting a layer down with that first to lighten other inks or putting it over and then being able to move from there. So here we got me uh, starting on the background. Um, I decided to do a handful of cards, not use up a lot of space, but just a little bit. So you see me lightly sketching out the cards 
And uh, what the heck is that? We're going to have to get rid of that. Never mind. All right, so the cards are drawn, and I decided to go for a red background uh, because of the red that I'll use in the cards and because the red goes really well with the green and rogues outfit. Uh, and it, it kind of feels a little bit like it fits in a little bit with, with Gambit's outfit as well. So again, doing a real light, dry draw with the ink and then going back over and brushing. Notice I changed the brush, so I'm using a, a larger, slightly larger square brush. Got a square because of the square tip. Really good for big, big, uh, broad strokes <clears throat> as opposed to finer detail, which is what the other brush is better for. It's called a round brush. Uh, all the other brushes I used in this were mostly round brushes. All right, so now I'm using the Copic White, which is beautiful, really rich, goes over everything reasonably well. Now this is an older container, so it's a little bit more watered down. I have to, you know, occasionally add water to it to keep it alive. Uh, I, I tend to figure out ways to somehow make these things last, but then I put them someplace and can't find them. So I, I think I have at any given time uh, like three or four different containers of the Copic White Opaque, but it's one of my one of my favorite art purchases. It's one of those things that uh, I used to use a lot of white gel pens, and now I am uh, I, I do it with the paintbrush and the white opaque. And although it takes a little bit longer to paint white lines on things uh, as opposed to just being able to draw them with a quick gel pen, um, it adds just a much more rich white, and it covers basically everything. The only thing I've found that it has a bit of an issue covering is uh, color pencil. Those of you who follow my Facebook page or my Instagram might have seen a Cthulhu that I recently finished. And there is uh, some crazy waves splashing around Cthulhu and around the, his hands as he's coming out of the water and grabbing at a boat that's in the water. And um, the white, like the crest of the waves was done with the opaque but it looks really like just beautifully cool beaded water because of the technique I used where I drew with the Prismacolor pencils and then put the opaque over it and the opaque covers pretty much everything but the waxy colored pencil and it, therefore it beaded up nicely. So right now I'm using that white to give just an extra pop of detail that even the, the white ink couldn't quite provide from the pencils themselves. Um, so. Again, because this is ink tense and it's ink, the white from the opaque goes over it really nicely. So a small round brush, good for detail. Uh, it's a, essentially called a detail brush. Uh, it's perfect for this. Just nice little small accents just to brighten up certain areas just a little bit. And then going back in for one final run to flatten out those cards because I want them to look nice and flat. I don't want to be able to see through them at all. All right, and here we, we're almost at the last touches. Uh, finished most of that red wash behind the cards and I'm starting to add the details in. Once the white was dry, I'm able to go in and just draw in nice and cleanly. The uh, markings that I want to use on the cards. So figured to do the queen on rogue side, the king on gambit side, and ace in the middle. And I uh, really didn't get a lot of detail out of the cards, just that little bit. And I could have done a little bit more of a design in the face, but that would have detracted from the design of gambit and rogue. So while it would have looked more like a card, it, again, it would have detracted. So you've got to plan that carefully. So you, you know, filling up that negative space is good, but filling it up with too much information is bad. So notice how I did a little bit of dry brush, went with some water, uh, added more water to liven up the ink, and then I'm going back in again to really brighten up that red at the bottom. Um, because I want that red at the bottom to be super intense in order to really you know, give it the idea that they're sitting somewhere. It's not just that they're floating in space. And notice how it gives it that nice little white border at the bottom. So again, just filling out spatially and, and making it feel like there's something going on there. So just getting that beautiful red pop. 
right, that's one of my, my favorite things to do is to really go in and notice I'll do it three or four times and just really hit that area. This does tend to flatten out the edge of the pencil, but it's worthwhile because look how solid that's getting. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice now. <clears throat> look how solid that's getting. I've got a, a video I did of uh, I shot recently of Harley and Joker pinup that I did for a commission, and there's definitely a lot of the really intense red in that, and I'll be able to show you that as I uh, post that video probably next week. Well, as I am cleaning up the letters just to make them nice and, and full, um, I want to let you know we're almost at the end. So I, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, let's get a, a little bit of a, a shot there. You can see my signature at the bottom. Thanks for joining. Don't forget to leave a comment, uh, and a, any questions, any thoughts you have in the spot at the bottom. So leave some stuff at the bottom. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining. Jason Sobelart.